Okay, so basically I'm going to be talking um, a little bit about the projects that I've been working on lately. So there's um, one website, web portal that we've built called Phenome Central, which is designed to help clinicians find other clinicians with similar patients. Um, and then more broadly, how that fits into the Matchmaker Exchange, which is sort of a, uh, an organization, a collection, an umbrella of a bunch of different organizations and databases that are trying to do this. Um, and we have an API to, to enable sharing between them. So I have just a few very introductory uh, slides to bring everyone to sort of the space that I work in, which is all of this rare disease work. Um, so in terms of motivation, we talk about rare diseases being quite common. Um, not any given rare disease is, is rather rare, but collectively there's a very long tail on this distribution. Uh, it adds up to about 5% of the population is classified as having one of over about 7,000 different rare diseases. Most of these are genetic. Um, most of them affect children, that sort of thing. Uh, so one of the problems with rare diseases, uh, especially in the, the genomic space, but overall, is that any given clinician may only see one patient with a particular rare disease in their entire career. So most of the patients that they see have these common diseases that they get really good at recognizing um, and, and identifying, diagnosing, that sort of thing. If they stumble upon a patient with a rare disease, they may not be able to recognize it correctly. If it's a known rare disease or if it's a novel rare disease, how, how do you figure out what is actually the genetic mechanism? Maybe you do sequencing, you identify some candidates, but you, can't, you need to confirm that in other unrelated families with the same thing. But that data is spread all around the world. You have a handful of, of patients that are seen by different doctors on other sides of the world. How do we connect these people together? So we have this web portal called Phenome Central. Um, clinicians are able to describe their, their patients uh, using standardized terms. So we use an ontology, the human phenotype ontology, to describe the different symptoms and clinical signs that the patients have. Um, and then they can provide diagnostic information or, or genetic information. We allow them to upload VCF files, which we try to prioritize the best that we can. Um, and then we take that into consideration when we suggest sort of the most similar other patients that we know of on our site. So we account the phenotypic similarity. We sort of show a breakdown um, of the phenotypic similarity between your patient and the other patient. Um, those terms don't need to be the same because it's organized in an ontology, and this is a hierarchical ontology, so the, the root is something very general. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail later on, but basically the root node is your patient has something wrong with them, and then there are children of that node which are something wrong with their head or something wrong with their arm or something wrong with their leg, um, and then it gets down to very, very specific terms. So that allows us to do semantic matching. So this patient is similar to this one because they both have things wrong with their heart, even if the terms don't say the word heart, and even if they're not the exact same ter term. Um, we can also do the same sort of thing from the genetic side. We have variants in these genes. We can prioritize the harmfulness of those variants or, or estimate it. We can estimate how relevant those genes are to the symptoms. Uh, we do that using uh, a tool called the Exomizer, which is out of uh, so it's a sort of joint effort, but it's basically Damien Smedley um, out of the Mouse Genomics Institute. Uh, so Sanger as in sort of collaboration with the people who do the HPO, which is out of Charité, uh, the Monarch organization. So out of Charité and in California and other places. So they have a sort of broad worldwide collaboration. They're amazing. Um, so Altogether, we end up on our system having about 1,600 cases that are deeply phenotyped, that most of which have exome data, most of which are undiagnosed still, uh, entered by about 600 users. So we collect data from several large consortia. Um, one is Care for Rare in Canada. We get data from the NIH's Undiagnosed Diseases Program, and we'll be collecting data from the larger Undiagnosed Diseases Network soon, um, and Neuromics in Europe, and and Andy. DI rare as well in France now. So, um, so let's say we have this database, Phenome Central, or or one of these other matchmakers. I'll go into that in a bit. Um, but 
on top of that patient data, you might want to expose it through several, any one of a bunch of different APIs. Um, we have the Beacon API, so this is one of the GA4GH pilot projects, uh, which basically, in, in its simplest form, is a public endpoint that allows people on the internet to ask, have you seen this variant, right? You have a public endpoint where you can say a specific variant on a specific reference, and then the, the endpoint returns either yes or no, I have this allele represented within my data. So it's a very uh, low amount of information that's returned, but it's incredibly useful for discovering uh, data sets or databases that contain information related to a variant of interest that you have. <clears throat> sort of in a complementary direction is this matchmaker exchange, um, which presents, is, is used primarily by researchers and clinicians. It's a restricted access database, um, and the API communicates between different servers to allow them to exchange these sort of patient profiles for the purposes of finding similar patients. So the matchmaker exchange overall is sort of um, part political collaboration and part technical collaboration. Um, so we have a bunch of different organizations which have come together to sort of support the interest of you know, being committed to helping different patient databases uh, helping people find matches across all these different databases. So these, most of these groups collect patient information, uh, have, have patient profiles in some, in some way, and are interested in finding rare sort of cohorts of rare disease patients across them. So the idea is that if you are a clinician who have, see a patient with a rare disease, you could submit that patient you could, you could record that information in any one of these databases and find a match in any of the other ones. So that we're, we're trying to break down the siloing of, of rare disease patients into these different databases and allow, allow matches across them. So on the technical side, we have an API um, that, that facilitates that connection and have work with the GA4GH's regulatory and ethics group to try to figure out what these policies are and the security working group to figure out how to, how to restrict this access and make sure that everything's secure, um, that sort of stuff. So for people who are sort of more interested in, in sort of these details, there is a special issue um, that we published which has 16 different papers in it from the different groups or different use cases. There's one that summarizes the project. There's one just about the API. Um, those are open access. Feel free to take a look. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about them uh, or want more information or about anything like that. But that's a resource that's out there in case you're curious. Um, the way that this actually ends up working in practice is we might have two different clinicians who submit two different patients into two different databases. The API then is used to communicate between those databases to identify whether or not there's any similarity between those cases. So the way that this API works, so I'm gonna go a little bit more into the technical side for this audience, uh, is that the, the request consists of a patient profile for that real patient that summarizes the phenotypic and genotypic information that's relevant to that patient. It's sort of like, the level of granularity that might be specified by a clinician talking to another clinician. Here are the sort of symptoms that my patient has, here are a handful of candidate genes that we've identified, that sort of thing. Um, and the response is a list of, of matching patients, sort of similar uh, patient profiles, potentially obfuscated depending on, on policies and consent levels and things like that. But it, it returns these set of similar cases and some mechanism, some link or something like that for following up with that clinician. So the way this looks, sort of in the, in a, you know, pseudo Cody JSON y way, is you are, are sending this JSON object that has sort of metadata, this ID, uh, some method for con who, who the owner of this record is and how do you contact them. Uh, other information about this patient, sex, age of onset, inheritance mode. This is very similar to the GA for GH, like individual object that they're working on in the metadata group. Some collection of disorders that are standardized terms, some collection of phenotypic features that are standardized terms, some collection of, of genomic features that are built on top of mostly genes or specific variants. Um, 
And then we're working on building in the ability to specify sort of stricter f um, filters right now in collaboration with the Beacon Group. So I'll go into that a little bit at the end. The way that these features work is basically it's a set of HPO, these, these human phenotype ontology identifiers, whether or not that phenotype is actually observed. So we can say, no, that phenotype was specifically looked for but not observed in that patient, an age of onset, um, and, and that information. So this is the, the, a, a specific symptom or clinical sign that's observed in your patient. Um, so I sort of summarized that a little bit before, but here's a, a diagram to convey that. The human phenotype ontology has about 11,000 different terms. So this is the language that we're using for communicating these, these <coughs> phenotypes, these patient phenotypes, and it's organized as a, a DAG um, in, in terms of how specific terms are. So leaves are very, very specific, very granular terms, and the root is this very general one, which is you have something wrong with you. So on the genomic side, we haven't quite figured out the right way of aligning this with the GA for GH specifications because the level that we're sitting at is generally not the specific variants. We're not as interested in specific calls or the details of those calls because we're sitting sort of as uh, on top of the clinical workflow, we're interested in usually this gene so just, just saying this gene, sort of by the name or by an ensemble identifier um, or this specific variant of interest uh, without dealing with call level information, without dealing with any of that uh, very low level information. So we, we're sitting up a little bit higher in the stack. Um, then once this information is conveyed from one server to another, that server that receives this request has to find the most similar patients in some way and then return a set of those. So there are a bunch of different ways that you could do this. Here's just a very simple way of visualizing one way that a server might do that. We don't constrain the way that servers do it and each one does it sort of differently. Each matchmaker has a bit of a different philosophy. But one way that you might do this is you have a collection of, of symptoms that are observed in a patient. That represents a subset of, of these terms within this ontology, right? A subset of the nodes within the deck. Um, if, a, if, a node is is, if a node is labeled for that patient, then all ancestors of that node are implied. So if you have this specific abnormality of your right hand, that implies you have an abnormality of your hand, which implies you have an abnormality, right? So node implies, implies ancestors. If we take two patients and we're looking at computing the similarity between those two patients, one really simple way that works pretty well is to look at those set of implied nodes and basically look at how much those overlap, the percent overlap. So uh, you can do that in a few different ways, but the simplest way is the number of nodes in the intersection divided by the number of nodes in the union makes for a really simple similarity score that works pretty well and is very quick to implement. Um, Within Phenome Central, more specifically, we also incorporate sort of genetic level information from exome data. So we have scored genes um, from this tool that then we combine with these phenotypic similarity scores to suggest patients that have both phenotypic and genotypic similarity in a way that tries to find um, matches where the genes are specific to that pair or that set of patients with similar phenotypes. So then the response returns sort of a list of patients with this sort of profile and this information, and then those servers send that information back to the clinicians that there was this match, and those clinicians can talk to each other. Um, the way that it's implemented right now is designed so that usually the information goes through a clinician at some point where they evaluate it and say, is this or is this not a good match? Um, there's a relatively high false positive rate uh, in dealing with either just gene level matches or even just phenotypic matches. Um, the rare diseases that we deal with are usually very incredibly variable in their presentation. So different diseases can be very broad in the phenotype space. And that means that it, it can be very hard to tell whether or not two patients have the same 
disease or a very similar disease just in the phenotype space. Okay, ding. Um, so I've just got another slide or two, um, but basically we have, so the, the main matchmaker exchange API is within the uh, GA4GH GitHub repo. We have a reference server built on top of Elasticsearch now um, to help people sort of get something set up really quickly. It's just a few lines and it'll download some example data um, based on publications, load it up into an Elasticsearch instance and, and serve a matchmaker exchange endpoint. We're working with Beacon right now to try to harmonize sort of genotype phenotype filtering because in the next version of the API that we're trying to release soon, we want to allow people a little bit more control. Right now, clinicians can basically only, they describe their patient. It's what we'd call query by example. You describe your patient, that specifies what is going, what the query is. The, the only control you have is how much information you provide about your patient, you don't get to say what is important about it. Um, and so we want to allow clinicians to say, you know, only show me results that meet these criteria. And that's also of interest for what Beacon is working on. But basically the way that this sort of looks is you can also specify a set of filters, for instance, over exome data where you set constraints over values of annotations that are associated with variants in that exome data. So this is a very sort of hand wavy, quick introduction to the sort of stuff that we're working on. If you have other questions about it, there's, there's I guess, time for questions after. But there were a lot of, there are a lot of people from a bunch of different groups who work on this. Um, so specifically, we have a team associated with Phenotips and Phenome Central. We work really closely with Care for Rare, um, which is this Canadian rare disease consortium, uh, as well as the NIH. And then we work very closely with HPO, the people who are responsible for the human phenotype ontology, and all of this ontological mapping, uh, which Monarch does cross species. And they use sort of annotations of, of phenotypes in model organisms to try to figure out what genes might be associated with those phenotypes in human. So that's, that's it. Okay. Hey, thank you very much.